extremism takes root in minds which are not able to have the mental resilience to deal with different and varying positions and views. You're listening to episode 47 of the National Secular Society podcast, produced by Emma Park. Just before Easter, a group of largely male Muslim protesters assembled outside Batley Grammar School in Yorkshire. They were protesting against the use of an allegedly blasphemous and racist cartoon of Muhammad, possibly from Charlie Hebdo, that had been used by a teacher at the school in a religious studies lesson. The headmaster, Gary Kibble, rather than supporting the teacher, or even reserving judgment, immediately issued an unequivocal apology. He described the use of such material as totally unacceptable and suspended the teacher pending a formal inquiry. Meanwhile, the teacher himself has gone into hiding after receiving death threats from Islamic extremists. His father said that he had been thrown under a bus by the school. The National Secular Society was one of the first organisations to draw attention to the Batley case. Stephen Evans, the CEO, wrote an open letter to the school urging it not to allow protesters to impose a blasphemy taboo that would restrict freedom of speech. Since then, responses from the rest of society have been mixed. The commentators who have come out most firmly in support of the teacher's use of the cartoons are, predictably, those in the right-wing media. The government has condemned the protesters, but without doing anything specific to help the teacher. Opinions on the left, from the media to politicians to teaching organisations, have varied from support for the principle of free speech, albeit hedged with qualifications, to disapproval of the teacher's decision to use cartoons that were offensive. In this episode, I'll be talking to three guests whose perspectives do not straightforwardly align with either the political right or left, a British Muslim campaigner, an ex-Muslim journalist, and the NSS's Stephen Evans. My first guest is Fires Mughal OBE. Fires is a British Muslim who in 2011 founded Tel Mama, an organization that aimed to monitor anti-Muslim hatred and provide support to its victims. He is currently director of Faith Matters, an organization that works to resolve conflicts and strengthen relationships between faith communities. In response to the Batley case, Fires wrote an article for The Spectator entitled, The Batley Protesters Do Not Represent Me. Fires Mughal, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. In your article for The Spectator, you claimed that the Batley protesters did not represent you. What motivated you to write this? Well, uh, it was important to get an alternative opinion out there into the public sphere and public domain, uh, predominantly because the, uh, the key view that was coming out from Batley was that a group of Muslims, a group of mainly predominantly overwhelmingly Muslim men, were standing outside a school. And the impression given was that it was potentially intimidating to the school itself, the religious chants outside the school, the view that a certain perspective of the protection of uh, religion was coming across. And I just thought um, there are many different opinions around issues of Islam within Muslim communities and the way that the Prophet can be depicted within Muslim communities. You know, people have different perspectives, and I, I wanted to ensure that that different perspective came out. You know, many Muslims like myself uh, want to get on with their lives. Uh, Islam is a very personal thing in our lives. We don't particularly see um, uh, see this enforcement, rigid enforcement of the way Islam is practiced as being fundamental to Islam. And we see a flexibility in interpretation of Islam and a flexibility which also involves how to discuss, learn, enjoy, and also include the views of others in how we practice and how we believe in our faith. On the spectrum um, of, of different Muslim beliefs, say from fundamentalist to more liberal, where would you put yourself? It's a very difficult scale uh, that you've given me. You know, it, uh, the conservatives, and groups of fundamentalists, and you know, and there is a different. There are differences, even in what I've just suggested here. Would say that uh, I would probably sit in a more progressive, liberal form of Islam, but I don't. I reject that totally. I reject those kind of bra- that bracketing totally, because actually, Islam is never, and religion never really sits into uh, these forms of brackets. You know, Traditions can be inter- interpreted and interpreted fluidly, and they change and go back and readapt and change over time. So, if I have to kind of 
say something. I would say that I would, I see myself as practicing an Islam which is fluid, which it takes into account the changing context of society. And I think any religion, any thought process, exactly goes through that adaptation over time. So they may say progressive stroke liberal. I would say actually realistic of my view of my religion. What response have you had so far from readers of your article in The Spectator, both Muslims and others? Well, the responses have been overwhelmingly positive, but obviously there are those who I've, I've had responses from, a handful of members of British Muslim community that have been negative. Many responses from British Muslims who have been very positive, saying exactly that, that actually, you know, they don't see a clash of values, that actually they live their lives in Islam is very personal to them. And, you know, and that they are just thankful somebody speaks up against the kind of brittle and against the marginal views of individuals like those standing outside Batley School. And so I've had, I've had a, a lot of positive responses from British Muslims, but also I've had some responses which have been literally saying, um, oh, we agree with you, but... And the we agree with you, but then goes on to say, but the picture was one which showed Muhammad with a, uh, a bomb on his head in the school. And my view to them is, well, what are you trying to then justify the actions on the back of what you've just said? You know, so there's this kind of, oh, we agree with you, but there's no we agree with you, but in this in this conversation, um, you can't agree and then take a dissenting view, which says, but you shouldn't show a cartoon, you know, irrespective of what that cartoon was, if it was used in the context of discussion to say what is the role of racism in our society, because, you know, let's be honest, some of these cartoons have a very, very strong racial overtone, right? They, they, they place Muslims, they place BME individuals in a very aggressive tone, obviously threatening tone with the bomb on their head, you know, a terroristic tone, if I can say that. But, you know, we're gonna, we, we have to have these discussions because these cartoons are already out there. As I've said before, within one or two clicks, somebody can find them online. We don't live in a society where you can hide things. Actually, I think, thankfully, and, you know, we're going to have to have these discussions. So if, you can, if we can have these discussions in a fashion which is facilitated, in which Muslim students do not feel targeted, but have their chance to say what they need to say and be heard and feel included in that discussion. And it's a discussion about racism on cartoons. And, it's, and it is a discussion about faith and its place in society. But it is done in a facilitated, in a fashion which does not target Muslim students, as I believe it wasn't done in Batley, then these are discussions we need to have because frankly, any kid, any kid or any individual within two clicks can find these cartoons. And if you don't have these discussions, the views that they can gather and gain by going online and just sitting in their rooms and watching these kind of dis uh, cartoons and listening to these kind of debates can be very polarizing. So we need to have these debates in our educational settings in a facilitated and in an inclusive way, which gets people to talk, young people to talk about these things without targeting other individuals in the classroom. So what you're saying is actually uh, one of the things that education can and should do is enable students to have the tools to look at controversial material, material which may inadvertently or may, may be designed to either satirize, attack, criticize people on the basis either of their race or religion. But doing this in the classroom, looking at it critically, looking at it in an open way, um, with everyone being allowed to speak, is actually a way of enabling students to deal with it, to um, test ideas, and and thereby to, to ultimately have a much more sort of a better, more mature understanding of it without just being polarized and absorbing um, extremist views either way. I think that's a really fair statement, and I think that sums up exactly what I'm trying to say. Is 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 just that, and I would I would I would also add, you know, I had an example. I've lived an example of this when I was um, when I was 17. You know, this this de a debate took place in my in my physics class where 
um, the Salman Rushdie of affair was taking place at that time and another individual had raised the issue that Rushdie had every right to publish the, his book. Just to be clear, this was um, when you were at school in Kent in the 1980s? And school in North London, actually. In, in North London, North, okay. Yeah, North London in the, 19, in the 19, yeah, 80s, that's right, late 80s. And so I was, you know, I was taken aback. I was hurt by that, that opening up of the discussion by this individual. I thought it's a physics class, why are we discussing this? Um, but I had my chance uh, to say what I needed to say, and actually the, the, the teacher was really good at allowing uh, different voices to speak, and the teacher made very clear that, that the Satanic Verses was clearly a work of fiction, and he made very clear that it does not reflect um, the reactions, do not, at that time, the reactions in Bradford and other parts of the country do not reflect uh, British Muslims. This is a debate in 1989 that was had in my classroom and the teacher facilitated really well. He made me feel that it was not an attack on Muslims. It was not a personal attack. It was a discussion about social issues and that actually my voice was important to be heard in that debate. Now, I was angry and I thought we shouldn't have had that discussion, but actually I changed my opinion after that. And I changed my opinion and I look back on that discussion and I, it was totally reflective of discussions we are still having to this day. And so I'm very thankful, I'm very thankful that teacher did what he did. And he came up to me at the end and said, look, how do you feel? You know, I hope you're not being hurt by this. It's not about you. Um, I'm glad you had your say. And the teacher did it so well. Um, and I look back and I think, thank God it, we had that discussion because it exposed me to alternative views. It got me to think. It got me to understand different people had different opinions. And it also got me to, to take on board that we could have a deeply divisive debate. But actually, in the end, I can still get on with people and I can still sit in the classroom and I can still smile and say hello to those pupils who have had these kind of discussions. So it made me learn how to listen to different views. So that is an example in 1989 of what happened to me. And if that took place 30 years ago, nearly 30 years ago, odd, frankly, why are we not having these discussions in that sort of a manner? And clearly, teachers can do this without Muslim pupils feeling marginalized and isolated. It's as if, it's as if those Batley individuals standing outside the school think that Muslims don't have the mindset or the capability to, to actually deal with such issues. It's, it's ludicrous. It, actually, they're marginalizing us out. Those Batley demonstrators are marginalizing Muslims out by giving this view that we are, you know, that we take slight to every issue, that actually we don't have the mental capacity to deal with this, this, these issues, which is just ludicrous. So what you're saying is actually Muslims, like anyone else, the best the best way of dealing with these controversial subjects is for everyone to be allowed to say everyone to be involved rather than excluding some people because um, you know the rest of society is so worried about even mentioning these issues. Well, well, that's right, and and I'll go further to say this. You know, I've worked in the field of extremism, countering extremism for twenty years. If you start, if society starts to say, don't talk about certain issues, don't look at certain things don't go in certain areas. Now, there is a line, okay, there is a line. You don't really want to pr promote violent extremist material in society. Clearly, there is a line. Um, but if, if, if the view is taken uh, within schools, educational establishments, within statutory authorities and other, and other sectors of society, that, you, that society really can't discuss, go there, look at, or view material to, to which has al which has alternative viewpoints, then we're in a very bad place because what it does it reduces the ability for somebody to have that mental resilience to deal with difficult issues in life, and actually it creates a society where polarization and ultimately and ultimately extremism can take root because extremism only takes roots in mindsets that are not able and not that are not able to be resilient to different thoughts. This is really key. Extremism takes root in minds which are not able to have the mental resilience to deal with different and varying positions and views. And that's the only way really you can 
create tolerance and, and understanding of other people is, is if you are intellectually able to cope with views which you might find perhaps threatening or offensive, but you've got to be able to deal with them if you want to understand other people and to communicate with them. Absolutely. The response of the um, head teacher in, in the Batley case was was absolutely the opposite of that. He apologised profusely for, for the teacher's use of the cartoon. And, and he said, you know, the teacher's been suspended um, pending a formal investigation. How should the head teacher have reacted? Well, the, the head teacher should have, in my view, taken time to consult with a wider set of parents. The first thing he should have done was to say, look, I'm not going to... Res- I'm not going to respond to this immediately because actually by responding to a group of demonstrators outside the school, I can give the image that these demonstrators have effectively changed school policy on teaching. And that's exactly what he did by responding so quickly to the demonstrations outside his school. He actually, he gave the impression that he, that, that the demonstrators could carry on this kind of activity, this kind of activity of, I would say, intimidation. And so, you know, he, sh- he should have taken time to consult with other parents, but also in the end should have come out with a decision, I believe, which said, you know, the school has the, the right to carry out teaching as it sees fit, again, in a way which doesn't marginalize students, but in a way which allows for debate and dissent. Now, that's precisely why we sent kids to school. Let's look now at the, the details of the Batley case and see how that, that um, idea of Islam might relate to that. Now, the full story of what exactly happened in the classroom has not yet been officially confirmed. However, it seems as though the teacher showed his class some cartoons from Charlie Hebdo, probably, which, which you have um, mentioned may have included the one with Prophet Muhammad with, with a bomb in his turban. Um, now, it seems that these were, were shown as part of a discussion about blasphemy. Um, it seems, though I think this is not yet confirmed, that the teacher did so um, after warning the students and inviting any who wished to leave the classroom. Now, the Muslim Action Forum which describes itself as an assembly of senior Muslim scholars and major organizations in the UK working to deal with affronts to global civility, um, sent an open letter to Boris Johnson condemning the use of the cartoons by the Batley teacher. Um, In particular, the letter claimed that the teacher's use of the cartoons was, um, and I quote, based on the usual attempt of inciting hatred and Islamophobia whilst pushing forward extremist white supremacist ideology. Why why um, do you think it is that the Muslim Action Forum framed the debate in terms of, of racism, Islamophobia? Um, is the simple act of showing an insulting cartoon of, of Muhammad in itself Islamophobic, or do we really need to look at the context? That's a, a really good question. Again, um, this is really a complex and a nuanced um, set of views I'm going to give you because because life is not as simple as black and white. We all know that. Um, the first thing to say is there should be no blanket bans on anything around thought unless it promotes violence in our society. Okay, That's the fundamental principle by which I live my life and it's a fundamental principle which I believe many British people live their lives by. The fact is anything is up for support, critique, etc. Any idea is up for either of the two, etc. Um, so no blanket bans, first thing. The second thing I have a real problem with is a group writing to the Prime Minister to effectively introduce blasphemy laws back into the UK. I have a real problem with that because we don't live in the medieval times, thankfully. And, you know, anyone who writes to the Prime Minister suggesting that we need to introduce those laws doesn't even live in modern reality today because it's bizarre. The third thing I would say is, here's, here's the nuance in my, in my thinking. Um, simply providing a cartoon is not the best way or simply producing a cartoon and letting kids have a free fall discussion is not the best way to, to discuss very complex issues. So I would say very strongly, you know, providing a cartoon picture and the teacher sitting back and letting kids go get on with it is not the way to teach this because it could reinforce, it could reinforce some stereotypical images. It could do that. What I am saying is context is absolutely key. And the, with context means introducing images like Mohammed with a bomb in his head, sadly needs contextual discussion if it is going to be used to challenge racism. 
if it is going to be used to to introduce why um, debate and dissent is important. But the context needs to, as I said, make clear that this is a, a, a cartoon which doesn't reflect the reality of all Muslims, that actually it is just the perspective of, of one individual drawing the cartoon, that actually the bomb on the head of a person who looks like they are from the Middle East has racist connotations, but we are discussing free speech. Um, and if it has racist connotations, let's talk about them. And if people see in that cartoon the need to challenge religion, let's talk about it. I mean, the, the, the presentation of Muhammad with a bomb on his head has so many different connotations that you can have so many discussions. And actually, by doing so, you are teaching, you are reflecting, you are bringing up these thoughts of, uh, of critical thinking in the minds of young people. You know, I look at that, I see a cartoon, and I, I see discussion around religion and faith, discussion around faith and society, discussion around racism and prejudice, discussion around stereotypes and tropes. It brings up so many threads in my mind, which in the end make me an individual who can have a richer and deeper thought process and a more critical thought process, which makes me a healthier individual going forward. Precisely what you've just suggested. We need to have these multiple discussions because in the end, there's no simple answer to a cartoon being produced. But if you don't produce a cartoon and a kid then who is inculcated with a view that you must never see this cartoon, you must never talk about this cartoon, goes and sees them, their, their view, I can guarantee you, will be one of anger when they see it. And their view will be, who is it that published that cartoon? What can I do? How can I challenge that? How can I fight back? Oh, this is disgusting. This is an attack on me. It becomes a far more aggressive and polarized response than the responses you get if you actually had these nuanced discussions early on in life. So one of the functions of education in such a case is, is to draw the sting from these sorts of materials. Absolutely. I mean, education is all, all about getting people to think and drawing the sting out of things which are difficult in society. Okay, it teaches us to cope with the difficulties of life. It's a fact that other teachers in British schools have in the past used the Charlie Hebdo cartoons as a resource for critical discussion without complaints or certainly nothing that has reached the headlines. Why do you think the Batley case has flared up now? I think the Batley case has flared up because of a combination of things. I talked about I talked about this on online stroke phone camp set of campaigns that have that have rumbled on. Those have taken root over the last three, four, five years. And so you've got increased increased activity, increased, I would say, quotation marks, silent activity. WhatsApp messages sent, groups sending these messages to mobilize and to create anger, to create anger in society, in parts of my co-religionists which then creates these flashpoints. So there's this bit, which is off the radar because these groups try to keep off the radar, don't want to leave a digital footprint, but they use mobile phones to spread this mob style campaigning. That's one element of it. The second element of it is after Charlie Hebdo, after Samuel Patti, this has become a bit of a flashpoint issue, which some groups know they can just rouse parts of the community to shut down discussion and debate. So we're moving in the wrong direction is what we're saying. Uh, with, with some parts of my co-religious, we're moving in the wrong direction instead of, you know, instead of looking at these issues in a, in a way which says, well, you know, let's just step back and take a level, level-headed level approach of, of, of talking and discussing and listening to the school. There's a reaction to it. And I think thirdly, I think thirdly, the Salman, I have to go back, the Salman Rushdie affair has in the minds of some of my co-religionists created a view that if you, if you shout long enough and if you make a noise long enough and if you give a view that people are insulting a whole set of communities, that actually you can just get them to stop talking about it. And I think a bit of that stuck and that, that means that people are using those same tactics and campaigns when issues like this come up. How do you see liberal and moderate um, Muslims or 
Muslims with a more fluid um, interpretation of Islam as, as you've characterized yourself. How do you see them participating in British civil society today and in the future? They participate really well. They get on and they're engaged in different parts of our society, different statutory organizations in the political sphere. They are in every facet of our society, but, but the loudest voices are constricting the space for them to talk uh, because they are frightened. That's the sad reality. They are frightened. Why are they so frightened? Because they don't want to have mobbing style text campaigns run against them, because they don't want to be smeared by Islamist websites, which which actually very good at maligning people. They don't particularly want to have must shut them out and have all the local imams say, don't speak about these issues. This is the reality. This is the reality. If you speak out, you will have these tentacles wrap themselves around your neck because of the loudest voices who try to malign you smear you, intimidate you, and that's why the majority of British Muslims, even if they have an opinion on this, will not want to speak out because they, like anyone else, just want a quiet life. But they are in, ve- in all parts of our society, feeling at home in Britain, feeling at ease with Islam in modern day Britain, and feeling that Islam has a space in this country, but they just cannot and will not speak out because of the thuggery and the intimidation of some of these fundamentalists in, in, my, in parts of my co-religionists who have had a free reign to intimidate for too long. How can we as a society counter um, this thuggery? By calling it out, by politicians having a spine. And I just wrote in the Times a letter two, three days ago, which said just that. When I have, I, I've worked for two decades with, with um, agencies like the Home Office and Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. I've worked on community issues for two decades. And I have simply lost count of the number of times when I have said to government officials, you need to challenge some of the rhetoric of these groups. You have the resources to challenge it. You have the means to challenge it. You need to support people who stand up against these groups. And civil servants, as I said in my letter to the Times, nod, agree. And when social media and the the mob style tactics start, government, not government, but civil servants run to the hills. They don't say anything. There's no no counter campaign against this kind of action. Uh, Very few politicians will speak up. And if they do speak up, you don't find much support around government machinery to support them. So there is no pushback from government, particularly civil servants, who literally, literally just wring their hands and put their heads in the sand. And that is why, that is why we are at serious risk of our, of our values in society, values which are in line with Islamic tradition of discussion, pluralism, freedom of thought, they are not different to Islamic tradition, Uh, they are under attack because actually our government machinery is not willing to push back in a coordinated way, nor support those members of British Muslim communities who are standing up. And eventually, as I wrote in the Times, who wants to be alone standing up, getting smeared, getting your employer written to, um, feeling in fear of your life? Who wants to do that? Because these people are essentially winning. They're winning. And we are, as a society, corroding, corroding from within because we're not willing to stand up for the majority of communities, including British Muslim communities, who actually enjoy the space in our society where they can live, be, and practice what they want. Fayez Mughal, thank you very much. Thank you. My second guest is Khadija Khan, a journalist and commentator who has written for publications including The Nation, Sisterhood, Aereo Magazine and Zedar, which is a platform for Muslim heritage voices to challenge prevailing narratives around Islam. Khadija, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Emma, for having me. First of all, maybe we could just start, Khadija, by telling us about your position in this. Um, 
I understand you you were brought up um, in a Pakistani Muslim family. Are you still a practicing Muslim? I was born and raised in a conservative household, religiously conservative household. And um, I believe children who are born and raised in, in such households, they don't have any choice um, when it comes to embrace uh, our, our religion or faith. So uh, they do what they are told and they uh, practice whatever uh, religion they are taught by their parents. So the same thing happened to me. Um, I followed religion, I followed tradition, I experienced um, religious uh, teaching and uh, religious, uh, um, uh, you can say, sayings um, as, as, a, as a child who was indoctrinated um, by, by parents, by the society, by peers. So uh, when I have this choice uh, to choose what to be, then I choose to be a humanist. So I call myself a humanist. Um, in terms of your heritage, do you still see yourself as part of the wider Muslim heritage community? Yes, it, it's, it's a part of what I am. I, I cannot just uh, um, refuse to be a part of this uh, you know, heritage. It's, it's what I am. And uh, they can, uh, there are certain elements, the radical elements, in, in the Muslim community, they would definitely abandon people like me and uh, try to alienate us. But that's a reality that I, I cannot change my words, my upbringing. Thank you for that um, introduction to yourself, Khadija. Let's move now to the Batley Grammar School case in particular. Have you been in touch with anyone who has been connected to Batley or have you been contacted by anyone who knows about it from the inside? I have been contacted by a person whose uh, sister, a practicing Muslim, you can call her, she, she, she wears hijab and she uh, identify her, identifies herself as a practicing Muslim. Uh, she teaches in that school and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really unfortunate that they, these people are facing harassment for not siding with the mob standing outside the school gates. And uh, it was really shocking for me. I would like to read the tweets I received from that person. Uh, it says, the, the tweet reads, our family have been dragged into this and it's been awful. My sister, a hijab wearing practicing Muslim works at, the, at that school. We know that school well and the teacher and they are so kind and respectful of Muslims. Knowing the truth from both sides, most reactions are based on hearsay. The other tweet says the issue could and should have been resolved privately and in a kind, respectful and civilized manner as Muslims are supposed to and not punish or judge. These extremists will threaten even good Muslims if they have a different opinion to them and demand they side with them. So this tells us that these people standing outside the school gates, they are not the representative of Muslim communities, of British Muslim communities, but by the mainstream media, by the concerned authorities, they have been portrayed as the spokesperson who are speaking on the behalf of the British Muslims and their demands, their uh, reaction, the aggressive reaction uh, to the whole situation is just unacceptable. Why, why do you think it is that uh, moderate Muslims or liberals within the Muslim community have not had more of a voice or have not been given more of a voice by the mainstream media? Yes, th there is a problem here that Prominent people, politicians, journalists from within the Muslim community, they, whenever something like this happens, they don't condemn the mob. They don't condemn the, the aggressive reaction of, of, from participants of, of that uh, you know, vigilante group. They always condemn what uh, is happening within the premises of school. Why did this teacher do that? Why you're talking about uh, 
equality for LGBTQ people. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, this happened in 2018 when a head teacher in East London, she had to reverse a ban on hijab for the, the girls uh, under eight year old. This was at um, St. Stephen's Primary School in, in 2018 yes. when, when the head teacher, Nina Lal, as you, you state, you, I'm describing your article, um, she'd introduced a ban on the hijab for girls under eight to improve integration among the children in the school. Um, but she was forced to reverse that um, progressive ban. Why was she forced to reverse it? Because it was deemed uh, like anti Muslim bigotry. It was deemed an attack on Islam. It was deemed uh, like uh, some kind of conspiracy against Muslim communities. When in reality, the truth of the matter is that in Islam, there is no compulsion for the children to wear hijab. It is uh, being practiced uh, right now uh, within the communities uh, for modesty reasons. We know that, and it's a very open secret. But for some pervasive, I would say, reasons, some people, they want their little girls to wear these uh, garments which are not uh, made for, for little girls. And the te head teacher, she only did it to protect these girls from, you know, becoming out isolated. And what happened to her? She received 500 abusive emails on daily basis. She was likened with Hitler. She was branded as pedophile. She had to apologize publicly. Who, who were the people behind this? Yes, that was also uh, a, a very, uh, like, that was also a hot discussion that who is doing it? These are obviously extremist, extremist element. And we say that we don't know about it. We know when people who are uh, resisting uh, these kind of progressive moves uh, within a school premises, they are following a radical and extremist interpretation of religion. So when these people are heard, she had to, uh, why did she apologize in the first place? Because she had no back. And you know what happened after this incident? That is more most uh, problematic part, that the discussion on hijab is has been shut down since then. There is no discussion on, on this issue anymore. And that is what they wanted to achieve and they achieve it. And that must, this incident must have emboldened them and encouraged them to continue with these kind of tactics. Because they saw that they worked. Um, these tactics of intimidation and of shouting loudly worked and had an effect on the authorities. Yes. So a very dangerous precedent has been set. They know that when they will shout out loud, they will be given privileges. They will be given, you know, free pass to harass and to intimidate educators and force them to reverse their decisions, which are not in line uh, with their own intolerant beliefs. Do you think on the side of, of the British authorities, on, on the side of the school or the side of um, the teaching unions, politicians from both left and right, do you think there is too much willingness to listen to extremist representations of Islam and to fail to really champion the values of, of free speech and, and real appreciation of, of different people's views and to just instead try to shut down discussion because they're so worried of being accused of um, discrimination. There is this situation, um, which is uh, that these are people, uh, I, I always say these are a bunch of extremist fanatics and they are being represent, uh, uh, sorry, they are being presented as the face of the Muslim community and mainstream media authorities, politicians, whenever they want to talk about uh, Muslims and anything related to Islam, they would go to someone who is very much conservative in their views. They want to talk about women's rights in Islam, they would talk to a woman who is very much conservative, who wears a hijab and who toes the line who would not defend women 
who would not defend women's place in Islam or in, in British society, but to parrot the narrative that is being, you know, uh, propagated by the male dominant uh, organization here in the Britain. And the problem with the authorities is that they are people who are very much progressive. They are Muslim reformers, activists, but they are not willing to talk to them because these people are not considered as practicing Muslims. They are considered as known practicing or who are not like Muslims anymore, ex-Muslims. The thing is that you need to address the problem, the extremist and radical views which are taking root in the community. You need to address that. And for that, you need to talk about those people who want to become a part of solution, not those who want to become a part of problem or who are part of problem. And one thing I would like to mention that there are people like uh, Baroness Saida Warsi, after this incident at Betley, what was she concerned about? She was concerned about uh, children from Muslim community being bullied and called terrorists in the schools. If it happens, if children are bullied, it's reprehensible. There is no ifs and buts. But tell me, a minority group of fanatics from within a minority gather outside of the school gates, intimidate the teachers, dictate apology to the school admin, force them to suspend teacher and force that suspended teacher to go into hiding with his family. You tell me who is harassing who? These are the people who should be condemned unequivocally by these politicians, by journalists, but they are not condemning. Have, have you yourself received um, violent or intimidating messages? Yes, I have received. Uh, I had to remove all information, personal information from about me from social media. Uh, I cannot share anything, any um, anything rela related to my family, uh, to uh, my personal life, and still I I receive these kind of threats. Uh, in fact, uh, some people try to you know locate my the area where I live. Uh, in, in the past and it was quite uh, concerning uh, for me but yes it happens because uh, it's it's not easy to confront these radicals and fanatics without having any support from the authorities and in such situation when authorities they refuse to intervene and stand up for people like uh, me and for people like uh, that suspended teacher, then obviously these these radical elements, they feel emboldened. They know that they can do it. They can threaten uh, us. They can just um, silence us with their threats, with their harassment. So the more the authorities turn a blind eye, the more the extremists are encouraged and the more they are likely to continue their um, te uh, techniques of harassment and intimidation. How can how can we um, as a society deal with this um, issue of of extremists and and neutralize them and prevent um, this spread of, of extremism and this tolerance of an, of this use of intimidation and this um, inequality of, of representation of different Muslim voices? There there is uh, a reality that uh, we need to concede. It's like religious extremists have successfully deployed harassment campaigns to make school administrations comply with their intolerant religious beliefs. We have seen that. And authorities didn't show any spine. And their recklessness caused us this uh, situation where we are today. The educators, they have no support. The people from within the Muslim community who are progressive, who embrace uh, democratic uh, values of a free society, they have no support because the government refuses to intervene. And uh, they, 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 there is always a preference these, these, uh, to, to appease these fanatics. 
there are efforts to accommodate the demands of, of these fanatics. So all of these things, they are not uh, helping anyway and not helpful to anyone. So we need to reflect, especially the authorities. There are people who are with conservative views. I'm not saying that we need to silence people. We want discussion. And that is the problem that we don't get to discuss these ideas without having any fear of you know, being intimid intimidated or harassed. We are not saying that silence people or shut down you know, the debate on the other side. We are saying that let the debate begin. Let people come together, together and discuss the ideas. There you can have uh, conservative voices as well as uh, progressive voices coming together and then we can find some solution to these problems. But when you will shut down a debate by saying that you are not allowed to offend uh, sensibilities of um, group of fanatics, then obviously there is no debate. And then you cannot resolve any issue. We need to listen to people, those who are conservative in their views and those who are progressive in their views so that we can come up with the solutions. And we also need to uphold the secular values of a free society because we know that these Freedom, to, uh, freedom of speech is not a religious value, it's a secular value. And we have to uphold this value for everyone. And that, that includes extremists as well, but that means that they need to um, accept freedom of speech for others too. Exactly. And you know, one thing I always say that all the time these conservative people and people like... Um, uh, Saeed Awarsi, Nasha, they are always in favor of uh, you should not be talking about this, you should not be talking about that, you should not be offending the feelings of Muslim community. I always say that the curtailment of freedom of speech, it's not good for minorities. We need freedom of speech to voice our concerns. And if we will talk about uh, the curtailment of free speech, we are cutting off the branch we are sitting on. We are a minority and we need to voice our concerns. We need to talk about the rights. We need to talk about uh, what are our problems. But when we will say that we should not, you know, there, there are other people who can be offended by you, you know, uh, by there are people who say that we are, we are offended by uh, looking at people with having long beard and, you know, wearing, uh, loose clothing and then wearing burqas and all that. So when you talk about protecting sensibilities, there is no limit. Once it is started, then it would be minorities who would be on the receiving end. So, so limiting free speech um, and in the long run is not going to benefit those who, who are already trying to suppress it. Exactly. Khadija Khan, thank you very much. Thank you so much. My final guest is Stephen Evans, who as CEO led the support for the teacher and was interviewed on BBC, ITV, Sky and other media channels. Stephen will be talking to me about the National Secular Society's involvement in the Batley case and why free speech is a value at the heart of secularism. Incidentally, I couldn't help noticing that the motto affixed to the now locked gates of Batley Grammar School is Forte non ignabe, which means with courage, not cowardice. Rather ironical in the circumstances. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you. First of all, um, could you just, for our listeners, go through what have been the National Secular Society's main efforts um, and its main involvement in speaking out against the protesters and the school's treatment of the teacher? Okay, so we, we issued a statement very quickly um, when we learned of the events that were unfolding uh, at Batley Grammar because we recognised straight away um, that this this was a a good example of how modern day blasphemy laws work. So it's not through the law, uh, but it's through uh, a culture of offense, uh, outrage and intimidation. And of course, the underlying threat of violence that's that's always there. And we were, we were really concerned that the teacher was on the receiving end of some pretty rough justice here. 
So, you know, we, we thought we can't have a situation whereby religious fundamentalists can have some sort of veto on what gets taught in schools or over what educational resources get used. So I think it was vital for us to make that point. And we were, we were particularly concerned that the school appeared to concede way too much ground to the protesters, uh, almost as a, uh, a knee-jerk response, which has, I think, made matters worse for the teacher. I think it's made it worse for the school. And actually, I think it's made it worse for Muslims everywhere because by issuing an immediate apology, suspending the teacher, uh, calling the materials totally inappropriate, they, they just sided straight away with the fundamentalists. And incredibly, from, from the footage we saw, the ringleader of the protesters, or one of them, appears to have been given a, a role or had a hand in drafting the school's statement. So I, I suppose it's not particularly surprising that it came out the way it did, but but by doing all of that, I think the school, they really hung the teacher out to drive. They, they threw him under a bus. And as well as being grossly unfair to the teacher in question, I think it fueled this climate of censorship and exceptionalism around Islam, which, again, it just does ordinary Muslims no favours. So, as you say, I, I spent a significant amount of time on TV on radio last week defending the teacher, uh, standing up for the principle of free expression uh, and the freedom to teach. And yes, the importance of not giving fundamentalists a foothold in our schools. Uh, and, and of course, we wrote to the school and the governors to express these concerns. You might think that a fundamental principle, in fact, of English law is that um, when a tribunal is reviewing the case, um, of, of someone who, who against whom a complaint has been issued, they must be impartial. But if they allow the protesters to be involved effectively in judging the teacher, that completely takes away from their impartiality. Well, absolutely. There just seemed to be no, no, not even any pretense of due process here. So we thought it was important that the school received some pushback for handling the matter in the way they did. You know, I, I fully understand that schools want to promote harmonious relationships with their local community. Uh, I think community co cohesion is very important and I think the school will obviously want to behave in an inclusive way. But the mistake they made is thinking that could be achieved by pandering to the religious groups who want to dictate what can and can't be taught. You can't do that by surrendering to the mob because we know their demands will never really be met. So, yeah, as I say, I think the school's re response just fueled this climate of censorship. Uh, in which we're all, we're, you know, we're all expected to accommodate uh, and, and uh, kind of live by these unreasonable and reactionary religious views and blasphemy codes. Khadija Khan has, in, has in fact, um, characterised um, the approach of, of the authorities in this case and in similar cases in the past, such as the Parkland Primary School case, um, the St. Stephen's Primary School case, as one of appeasement of extremists. Would you agree with that? I think that's a fair summary of the school's knee-jerk response. So um, obviously they have since launched an independent inquiry. Um, but, you know, the point of our letter to the school was to kind of rein them in a little bit and just, just remind them, uh, first of all, that their priority should be the safety and the well-being of their member of staff. Um, we asked them to uphold the principle of free speech and not submit to these unreasonable demands of what was actually a very small group of protesters who, who, who want to impose this blasphemy taboo on the school and, and I'm sure society as a whole. And we made it clear to the school that by issuing an immediate apology rather than defending the principle of free speech and the freedom to teach, the school had actually sided with the religious fundamentalists. So we urged them to, in the letter, we urged them to keep in mind that the protesters who shout the loudest are not necessarily representative of all Muslims. Uh, in fact, by assuming that Muslims will take offence at the use of the cartoon, I think is itself patronising to Muslims. So we asked the school for an explanation of the rationale behind their decision. Um, none has been forthcoming so far, but of course we know that an inquiry has now been launched. So you've had no responses to your letter from the school. What about reactions to the Batley case um, by politicians of, on the left and the right, by the media and by the unions? What, what sort of a range of reactions have we seen? 
largely as expected, I think. Most politicians have stayed silent on the issue. The local Labour MP praised the school's actions in apologising to the protesters, so that wasn't particularly helpful. The Education Secretary and the Department for Education have been uh, a little bit more helpful. They, they certainly condemned the nature of the protest and made clear that schools are free to include a full range of issues, ideas and materials in the curriculum, um, including where they are challenging and controversial. So that was that was somewhat helpful. Teaching unions have stayed largely silent on the issue, which is somewhat alarming, I think, given that you know one of their profession is in hiding uh, and in fear of their life suspended simply for doing his job. Um, to be fair, I think the, the National Education Union, they did call for the teacher's name and identity to be protected. So, you know, that, that, that's something, I suppose. And I, I, I've since heard quite recently, actually, the head of the NAS UWT has said that teachers shouldn't be subjected to threats for doing their jobs, which you would have thought goes without saying. Um, but it also said that con controversial topics need to be debated and not closed down in classrooms. So maybe we are starting to see a little bit more uh, in the way of support from the teaching unions. I think they've been heavily criticised and rightly so. So, um, yeah, maybe we, we're starting to see a little bit of movement from there. But, you know, it, it's often the case that there is an unwillingness, I think, on the left of British politics to speak out against Islamism. I think it's part of a misguided attempt, perhaps, to protect and defend Muslim communities, but I think it actually does them more harm than good. But as for the media, well, the, the, there has been some really good commentary, obviously, from Fiaz Magal and, and uh, Khadija Khan. Uh, we also uh, saw Keenan Malik writing a really solid piece in The Observer. Uh, Matthew Saeed, the leader writer in The Times, The Sunday Times, wrote an excellent piece on the issue. So the media has given this some exposure, and I think, by and large, they handled it fairly well. Um, it's quite clear to me that the protesters have very little support, nor should they. But unfortunately, some of the Muslim commentators on the issue, their support has not been forthcoming, really, for the teacher. They've certainly said that the, they've criticised the protesters, but they seem to be saying that they do have a point. And I think their concern has been more for um, how cartoons can stir up blasphemy than it is for this, this teacher who's whose career could be in ruins and his life is in danger. Perhaps the most sensitive or difficult aspect of the whole case is that the extremists, um, Islamists, and the very, um, it might, we might say the very orthodox or conservative Mus Muslims who have come out, been the ones protesting, have accused the teacher of Islamophobia and even of, of white supremacy and and all sorts of things like that. They've very much blurred the boundary um, between blasphemy and racism. They've indiscriminately accused the teacher of both. Is this fair? There are clues to what happened in the lesson from the petition that was actually posted by the students to, to save their teacher's job. So according to their accounts, students were given advance warning that the cartoons would be shown. The intention appears to have been to educate pupils about uh, blasphemy taboos within the Islamic traditions uh, and the controversy surrounding the cartoons and the way in which the cartoons have been used or, or utilised to demonise Muslims and feed the narrative that Islam is inherently violent. And, um, you know, I, I certainly don't think that cartoons poking fun at religious authority uh, automatically do that. Um, I think, actually, I think satire is an excellent way to challenge religious authority, but but that racist element can be there. So I think it's useful to have an awareness of that. But there is absolutely no suggestion that the teaching was intended to be in any way uh, disrespectful towards Muslims. And actually, I think it was quite the opposite by all accounts. Uh, so some of the things that we've heard from the protesters, that this was an attempt to stir up religious hatred, that it's racist, that the materials were used in a threatening manner, uh, you know, leaving children concerned for their safety and well-being. I think some of the protesters said, I mean, they're so far off the mark, they're, they're quite frankly unhinged. And the very fact that this assumption was even made shows what kind of a victimhood narrative some of these protesters have. Finally, let's, let's just think about the general principle. So we have material which might be blasphemous in, in its depictions of Muhammad. We might have material which might be both blasphemous and potentially racist if it, if it depicts, um, say, um, 
a Middle Eastern man um, in a turban with a bomb, as has been the most sort of notorious cartoon. Um, but how can materials like these have a place in the class? I mean, we might think of the parallel that has been drawn with, um, say, anti-Semitic cartoons used by the Nazis, which are taught in history lessons. Um, how should they be taught? Where is their place? How can they be used in an appropriate way to contribute to a culture of free speech? Well, I think they are illustrative examples of the uh, interface between religion and public life and you know the impact that religion has on society. So I, I think the whole controversy that we've seen, actually, it, it speaks to a need for better human rights education generally in schools. I think we need to do a better job of teaching about the liberal democratic principles that underpin our rights and freedoms and, and also our responsibilities as citizens. And naturally, any such education will include giving pupils a, a solid understanding of ideas and principles around freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression. And one very obvious and engaging way of teaching about this is by using the cartoons that have caused so much controversy. And, you know, the cartoons that test our ability to protect this fundamental human right. Um, no question, the cartoons can be divisive, but I think we need to trust teachers to handle this appropriately. And I certainly think they should have the freedom to teach. The decisions around what kind of materials get taught in schools should be, um, those decisions should be taken by the professionals, the teachers, and they certainly shouldn't be influenced by intimidation and threats from religious extremists. But I think, as Fiaz Magal has said, you know, we do need to have these discussions about religion and its role in society and doing it in a calm, uh, critical, uh, mature and inclusive way in the classroom is the ideal environment for that to happen. So I, I, and I also I think it's an ideal way to address some of the polarisation and the extremism that's going on in our society and, and, and also the marginalisation of Muslims that's going on, because in a pluralistic society, we all need to have the ability to live with differences of opinion. We need to be able to handle and evaluate alternative and conflicting views. And, and the schools are the ideal place for these discussions to take place. And of course, it, it should go without saying that Muslims, just like any other pupils, need to expose to these different points of view. So the message is trust teachers, trust students, um, allow people to develop the critical tools which will enable them to see others' point of view um, and make up their own minds. Absolutely. I think that's the recipe for um, an inclusive, pluralistic, secular state going forward where everyone's rights and freedoms are respected and um, allowed to flourish. Stephen Evans, thank you very much. Thank you. This episode was produced by the National Secular Society, all rights reserved. The views expressed by contributors do not necessarily represent those of the NSS. You can access the show notes and subscriber information for this and all our episodes at secularism.org.uk forward slash podcast. For feedback, comments and suggestions, please email podcast at secularism.org.uk. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a positive review wherever you can. Thanks for listening and I hope you can join us next time.